everybody, welcome back to the Listener's Guide. Uh, I'm here with a special guest, Jeremy Johnson. No relation. A little bit of a relation. We were roommates <laughs> in college. And we're cousins. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna play the drop needle test again. For those of you who don't know the rules, we're going to play famous music pieces at each other. Uh, if you can guess the piece with just a short excerpt, you get two points. If you need a little bit longer excerpt, you get one point. Uh, you also get one point for guessing the composer and one point for guessing the date within two years. And the person with the most points wins. We have 20 possible points. Um, so let's get going. Who's let's gonna go it. first? Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. To find them. John Cage, four minutes and 33 seconds. <laughs> Oh, is this uh, Wagner das Rheingold? Uh, no. Hold on. Oh no. Let me let me do that again because I think that's just the recording and it just hasn't started. <laughs> I think the music just hasn't started yet. <laughs> oh. <yeah. laughs> All right, that's what you get. <laughs> it's Strauss. Also sprach Zarathustra. Okay. Um, what year would that have been? Eight. 1996. Exactly. Really? <laughs> it's a tone poem by Richard Strauss, uh, and it's most famous, obviously, for uh, being in 2001, A Space Odyssey, and it's inspired by a book of the same name by Nietzsche. This one, I'm giving you a really short, really short one, <laughs> because if I play you any more, you're going to recognize okay. it. Okay. The long one's gonna give it away. <laughs> oh, Fortuna, it is the closing and ending movement of Carl Orff's. The closing and ending being the same thing. It's the opening, opening and ending. <laughs> opening and ending movement of Carl Orff's Carmina Burana. I'm gonna go with 19, 1928. Oh. Close! But no cigar. Nah. It was, it, you were right, so you got two points because you got Orf and you got Carmina Burana with a long excerpt. But it was 1937. So Orf's Carmina Burana was based on a bunch of medieval poetry that was discovered. Um, apparently, I heard somewhere that it wasn't translated, but when I was doing research for this, um, it seems like people knew what this was about the whole time. Uh, just a collection of stories from a sort of fake group of monks about just general drunken debauchery. Yeah, drunken debauchery. There's a very long section about worshipping the spring, if you know <laughs> what I mean. <laughs> I'll, I'll play the first word. So I'm gonna guess that that's like a recit leading into a famous aria. Sounds kind of like Latin or Italian. Okay, let me fast forward and see if I can find the famous part. That is an aria from uh, Leon Cavallo's Pagliacci, and it's the part where- I've never where seen it. It's a scene where Kanyo, the tenor, just found out that his wife was cheating on him with someone else in the town. They're, they're a traveling clown group, and they, his wife is part of it, and she's cheating on him, and he just finds out, but he needs to go perform as a clown anyway. So it's like he's put on the makeup, oh. and he's going to go be sad and cry about it. Yeah, so I got zero points. Zero <laughs> points. Okay. This is round two. I can't even really tell what instruments those are. It's like electronica, but also strings. You want the long one? I do. This might give you a little more of a hint. The repetitivity? Repetitiveness? Makes me want to say Philip Glass, but doesn't sound like too much of what I know of Philip Glass music. So, Steve Reich? Okay. Is this oh, Steve Reich? Yeah. yeah, it's totally Steve Reich. Okay, <laughs> got it. It was Steve Reich, okay. 1987. Ah. Different trains. 
Steve Reich writes a lot of music that draws on his Jewish heritage. Um, and so Different Trains is an exploration of trains during the World War II era. He has a movement about trains in America, and these, it was recorded with interviews. It was so cool. Um, he interviewed a bunch of people who lived through World War II. So movement one, they're all talking about like how cool it was to have all these cool trains in America during World War II. Then movement two, he's talking to Holocaust survivors about riding the trains to concentration camps. Um, and then movement three is when the war is over. Oh, okay. And it's a, it's a very powerful piece. Um, and it's all based around those train sounds. That's what I was okay. trying to get you to. Cool. So it's like string quartet plus uh, cassette tape. So you got one point. Yeah, four to three. All right, here we go. I was tempted to choose this one, <laughs> but I didn't. That's movement four from Mozart's Jupiter Symphony. That symphony number, I always get the number wrong because I can't remember whether it's 41 or 42. It is the Jupiter Symphony. I, I think it's 41. Mm -hmm. Jupiter Symphony number 41. In Mozart in C major. 17 something. 17, I don't know, 85. So close. Just out of it. It's 1788. <laughs> so yeah, that's Mozart's last and longest symphony. And it is super famous for all of the themes in the symphony being invertible counterpoint. So he introduces little themes throughout the exposition of this movement, and then at the end, he reintroduces all of them at the end, and they're all inverted all over each other, and it's amazing. It's, yeah, it, it's a lot of theory talk, but the way that I usually explain it to people who don't understand is that it's like you go to a circus and you see an acrobat, and he's riding in a unicycle and you're like, oh, it's cool that you can ride a unicycle. And then you see him like walk the tightrope and you're like, oh, that's cool that you can walk the tightrope. And then you see him juggling and you're like, oh, that's cool too. And then he does all three at once. And you're like, what? <laughs> so seven to three. Oh, I'm down by four. I need to get all of these ones right. Okay. You know this. Do I? <laughs> yes. I believe we attended a performance of this together. Oh, you hear the longer version? I want to say like Bernstein. Very close. Or Copeland. Okay. It's Copeland, yeah. <laughs> you don't get a point for that. Well, why not? I, I was egging you on so much. No, oh, but I said I want to say Bernstein. I didn't say I'm saying it's Bernstein. I said I want to say it. So, it's Copeland. Okay, so you get one point. Yeah, so Copeland's Ballet Rodeo, which is about a tomboy cowgirl who tries to win the love of um, various cowboys, like two main cowboys, the Wrangler and the Roper, but they're both more interested in the rancher's daughter, who's like more of a feminine southern belle. It's a pretty funny, campy, very American ballet. It's pretty cool. Ready? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm not hearing a voice yet, which makes me question whether the track I'm on is correct, but it sounds like you're also stopping right before someone <laughs> would come in, which makes me think that I am correct. Uh, Im wunderschöne Monat Mai. Oh, interesting guess. But it's not, by the way that you said that. <laughs> Can I get the longer one? Yeah. I don't know at all. No. This is uh, Beethoven Piano Sonata number 28 in A major, opus 101. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's famous because um, it was written in 1816. It's one of his final sonatas, written in his final musical period. It's famous because this is when Beethoven starts um, experimenting with um, the size of his pieces, and this sonata is real. every theme is super tiny. And usually Beethoven sonatas are like big and, and, and wild and grand. And then this one, this whole movement lasts all of, you know, three minutes or something hmm. like that. And um, that first theme that you heard is the first theme of the sonata. And it is like two bars long or something. It's actually in sonata form, but everything is just so condensed into a tiny little thing. <laughs> this might be the hardest one that I have left. Oh no. <laughs> Okay. 
I'm gonna go handle. I'm gonna guess it's the opening to an aria from Giulio Cesare. And I'm gonna guess 1720. Well, you got the composer right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want a bit of a longer? Yes. Longer one yeah, to try some again? It. Yeah, let me see if I can get on the longer one. I don't think I think you know too much music. I think that's the problem that we're having right now Because <laughs> <laughs> that's the overture to the Messiah. Oh <laughs> Yeah, that's the overture to Handel's Messiah uh, Which was from 1742 <gasps> Davy C Which one is it there are the two because it's either Claire de Lune the girl with the flaxen hair well, Claire de Lune is the one that has the major minor seventh chord, right? So that's so that's got to be the girl with the flaxen hair. No, this is Claire de Lune. Ah! <laughs> which is from his book of Preludes, which means that this would be 1912. Dates are tricky because it's actually it's not from his book of Preludes. It's from oh. uh, his suite Bergamasque. It's the third movement of of that suite. And he started the whole suite in 1890, but didn't finish it until 1905, because W.C. didn't have the strongest work ethic of all composers. <laughs> so I got one point. Last question of the whole game. I know exactly what this is. <laughs> No. This is one that band people know. Band and orchestra people know. Oh, I am neither of those types of person. So disappointed in myself. I feel like we've been studying this in music history class. We might not have. No? I mean, we've definitely studied something by this composer, but I don't know that yeah. we did this piece. I'll just go Strauss. Rieger Strauss, 19... I'm gonna go 1904. Well, this was actually earlier. No. Strauss. Well, okay. this particular one was contemporary, but the composer, I think, started before Strauss. Too. Okay. It's Mahler's Symphony Number no. Five. Okay. Which premiered in 1902. Okay. Hey, so I got the date. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, I said 1904. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> so you got one point. Um, Mahler is generally known as a composer of song, um, but he also wrote a whole lot of symphonies that are, I guess, they're equally famous. Yeah. The big important thing for him is that he. Uh, well, there's actually a lot that's important about him. He's a Jewish composer um, who actually somehow survived all of the late uh, 19th century German anti-Semitism. Um, he was pretty much the only Jewish man that was allowed to continue creating wildly popular music in Germany despite all of that rampant anti-Semitism. And he also believed that his music predicted his future. So, like, when he wrote his songs on the death of children, he's convinced that that's why his children died. He, he had a rough life. <laughs> Our final score was six to eight, which is a little bit disappointing for people who consider ourselves uh, music aficionados. But I did want to thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. Um, and if you are interested in seeing our bonus round questions, make sure that you check out my Patreon page in the description. Please remember to like and share and subscribe. And I will see you all next time on the Listener's Guide. Bye, everybody!